The Victorian Kitchen series, how did that come about? Was that because the other series had been so popular? Yes, uh, it did follow on, but it followed on very naturally uh, because, after all, when you've grown the stuff, the thing to do is to cook it and once you've cooked it to eat it so there was that continuity there but it was a a follow-up yes and what was your particular role in that series well behind the camera uh, with great relief uh, rather than in front and discussing first of all the produce and, and and making sure that the produce was authentic as it as it could be and then of course doing the doing the voiceover so how did you find that absolutely amazing kitchen? I mean, that was a real find, wasn't it? Yes, and it uh, I have to say it got better after the props department had spent six weeks in it than it had originally. But the wonderful thing was that the, the range, the dreaded range, was in place and remained just as it was. But it, that uh, kitchen, which was the authentic kitchen of, of, of a big house, was actually only about 20 miles away from Harry's Garden uh, in another estate, sitting there left and, and deserted when the family changed its kitchens from one location to another and the older kitchen was left as a storehouse, I think, and that's what, that's what it was found as. Lucky you. Yes. And uh, what were the particular problems about restoring it? Well, trying to make the range work, um, but also really um, working on the fixed furniture and, strangely enough, turning a very authentic looking floor into another authentic looking floor, but one that didn't make quite so much noise when Ruth walked about um, because it was just too noisy for, for filming. So um, the floor, I have to confess, is a phony. The floor is painted on to a sound absorbent surface. And what about the furniture? Was that original? Was that there in another room? or No. Um, well, the most authentic piece is part of that magnificent dresser. So that's, that was there. The table was made for the series and actually was sold and used again afterwards. So that has lived to see another day. When you say um, there was part of the dresser there, what part was there and I think it was where the, did you get the, the other? The lower part and the, the rest was, was made, was made by, by joiners for the series, yes. And then aged as only props departments know how. And was there anything else that was quite interesting about that set that perhaps we wouldn't immediately think of? Well, one of the doors was a brick wall <laughs> in other words, we needed to have a, a, an exit point so that people could apparently walk out and indeed deliver things to the rest of the house. It was, I think the right phrase is, the beige, the green beige door, the one that separates between upstairs and downstairs. And so through this they had to pass. But there being no passageway, the door was just um, built onto the face of the brickwork. So you can imagine going out with a tray full of food. Uh, you opened the door and then you had to apparently walk through, but actually you just had the little angle between the door and what the camera could see to sort of squash yourself until someone shouted cut. <laughs> so it was quite a skill, um, apparently exiting from a door that wasn't there. Into a brick wall? Into a brick wall. That was a bit that was there. And where did that wonderful array of copper pots and pans and all the other utensils come from? They were marvellous, weren't they? They came from the cellars of the big house that Harry Dobson works for. Uh, and I think they'd been put away in the Second World War or something anyway, when they were no longer wanted, all wrapped up in newspaper and just down in the cellars. And we were told, yes, if there's anything there you want, help yourself. And it was like an Aladdin's cave. 
And it really was wonderful. And I think that piece was filmed and, and I think everyone's emotions were totally genuine. We really were as excited as it appeared to unwrap these things. We didn't have an opportunity to unwrap them before they were filmed. So it was discovery on camera. What sort of condition was the copper in? Fairly green. Yeah, I mean, beautiful surface underneath because it had never been scratched or anything, but, you know, 40, 50 years of oxidation had taken place. And um, how did Ruth come on the scene? Because she was a real find, wasn't she? Well, she was, and um, I think she was recruited through her contacts with the Women's Institute. Women's Institute were asked, and um, she was uh, uh, an active member and uh, there she was, once seen, decision made instantly. Yes, you felt she was really in control of that kitchen, didn't you? And the rest of us. What particular problems did she have to contend with um, in the making of this series? Well, you know, I'm going to keep coming back to that range because it haunted us and it haunted her as well. I mean, just to light it was a challenge. Um, the first time we lit it, it was the end of filming for the whole day because the place filled with so much smoke that it didn't <laughs> clear in four hours. I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was a nightmare. But, um, yeah, we, we learned slowly to be Victorian uh, skivvies and indeed Victorian chefs in, in, in her case. And um, often um, it was said in, in, in the Victorian Kitchen series that um, the cook in those days would take three days to make one particular dish. Yes. I mean, not every moment of every day, but it would, the preparation of, of it would yeah. go over three days. Is this yeah. what actually happened with, with Ruth? Yes, I mean, it was, it was one of those, the, the longer something took to do, the more difficult it was to do for obvious reasons, you know. You can follow an omelette through from start to finish, but something that has to be marinated and then chopped up and then put away and then brought back out again, you're very, very difficult to telescope this. And of course, difficult to actually supervise just the, the hygiene of a thing over that length of time. But Ruth was able to do a lot of this in her own home um, and, and gave over a lot of space in her own house to actually doing that. But even if not everything was cooked in that kitchen, it was all cooked by Ruth Mott. And that, I think, is the important thing. She didn't have an army of people hidden away in the background who were actually doing the job. What did the dishes actually taste like? Well, that, I have to answer that in two ways. Some, of course, we couldn't cook because they'd just been too long hanging around. Um, and, and it would have been a bit dodgy on tummies to have... You mean uh, the preparation eaten. of? Yes, yes, the preparation indeed. Um, but everything that was, that was cooked was, was tasted and eaten and enjoyed. I mean, to be honest, you'd have to go back another two or three hundred years to get to a point where we simply couldn't recognise the things. I mean, this was good home cooking on the giant scale, wasn't it? That's... That, comes through so clearly in the film. So it was, it was authentic and it was uh, country fair. And did Ruth find it easy to work in that kitchen? Uh, I, I think, you know, she had actually worked in such places before. And although Ruth is absolutely confident that things have got better and not worse since those days, Ruth is a a modernist by nature. She believes in progress. She fitted back into that very comfortably. And she never complained because something was, was difficult. She got on with it. And um, how far was the choice of the recipes that she did dependent on what Harry could grow in, in the walled garden? Well, not at all, really. I mean, first thing one has to remember is there's a lot of meat and fish and things like that coming into the story. And clearly we didn't expect Harry to go and uh, uh, shoot the deer and present an the ox. venison and kill an ox. No, uh, so, so that side is, 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 is from the trade in some way. And the other side of things, everything that Harry could grow was grown at the garden and out it came. 
only about 20 minutes away by car, so fresh produce delivered. But if it came to another thing, like for instance mushrooms or something, then they would be they would be bought in the in the market. Yeah. And what was the relationship between a head gardener and a cook? What was that all about in, in, in um, the Victorian heyday of grand houses? Well, no doubt some of them married each other at the end of the day, but otherwise I should say fairly tense, fairly brittle. See, who was really in charge? The head gardener had this good relationship which uh, with with the with the owner the owner's wife often you know a relationship was almost as if the aristocrats were the the patrons of the garden so in one sense they're very comfortable with that relationship the cook didn't have such a good relationship the cook was very much more of a servant and yet the cook was in the driving seat when it came to saying what was wanted i mean orders of the day were for X, Y, and Z vegetables and fruits. So, you know, who was quite who was quite the top in the hierarchy, which is so characteristically Victorian Britain, you know? And uh, what was the relationship between Harry and Ruth? Uh, well, they got on they got on very well together. Um, uh, different personalities that comes through very clearly. But um, well, we never saw any blood on the carpet. Or should I say, on the false floor? <laughs> was Ruth happy with the way the dishes turned out? Do you know? Was she happy with the overall look think, of the kitchen, gar the Victorian kitchen? I think she was. I think that it gave her a great deal of pleasure, um, and um, uh, like the rest of us, she has she has found that there's a real interest in this subject still. There's a it it, it rekindled interest people became curious that had never really given it a second thought before and she's been able to communicate her skills and her enthusiasm through demonstrations, lectures, visits to places since and I'm sure she's enjoyed that. And what were your most enjoyable moments from the, ki the Victorian Kitchen series? Well, uh, it really seeing the thing through, seeing the conversion of that, that food in the form of fresh fruit and vegetables particularly into dishes because as I've said I, I enjoy cooking I'm curious about it I, I like particularly farmhouse cookery and well I mean who wonderful lesson wasn't it watching there a, a real expert in the thing doing it the proper way so it was it was that that I really enjoyed yes